Hi everyone! When I first heard about the mesh statement in Godot, I thought it was going to be just another way to handle branching conditions, like in most other languages. However, as I started diving into it, I realized how much more powerful this actually is, and I can't wait to show you all the amazing things this can do. So, if we go to our code, you'll see that we can use a match on our variable to check for some of its values. So, for example, I could write match x, and if x is 1, I could simply print 1. If x is 2, I could print 2. And we could test for a different type of value, so I could write something. And if it's something, then I just print something. If I now save, if I press F5, you'll see that our program prints 1. It prints 1 because we landed on the first branch as x was 1. However, if x were to be something, then if you press F5, you'll see that this prints something. Now, not only can we match for a variable x, we could be matching for any constant expression. So for example, I could write match type of x, and this would match for the type of x. So I could write type string, and if it's string, I could simply print string. However, if I want to match for type, I don't know, bool, then I would print bool. Now if I save, if I press F5, you'll see that I print out string because my something was a string. But if I change this to true, I press F5 and you see that I print out bool. However, you might notice that our second match did not print anything. And this happens obviously because our x is true and 1 does not equal to true, neither does 2 and neither does something. Now, what if we wanted to have a default case in which we print, even though we haven't landed on any of these branches? Well, for that, we could be using a wildcard pattern, which is written as an underscore. And now I can simply write print nothing found. And if I press F5, you'll see that I print a boolean and I also print nothing found because true is not found among these branches. And that is not all. We could get even more power by seeing what we matched with. So for example, instead of using a wildcard, I could be using a binding pattern. Now a binding pattern is simply a pattern that binds the value to a variable. So instead of a wildcard, I'll write var result. So now we could go to our print statement and change it to nothing found except result. And if I press a five, you see that it's nothing found except true. This binding pattern is especially useful for when matching arrays or dictionaries. For example, let's erase everything and let's set our x to an array. I could make it like one, two, three, and four. Now, in this match, we could be checking for a lot of things regarding this array. We could first of all check if the array is empty, so I could just write no array and print empty. However, we could also check for exact matches for our array. So we could check for one, two, three, four. So print exact match. Or we could even be using a combination of wildcards and binding patterns because everything inside an array also becomes a pattern for that element of the array. So I could be writing something like, okay, anything on the first place, anything on the second place, anything on the fourth place, and four at the end. And this prints matched four at the end, okay? And I could also bind these things to a variable. So I could write var first and underscore and underscore and four and print matched first and for at the end. Lastly, I could be matching for only a few elements of the array. So for example, I could check if I have a one, if I have a two and anything else, which is marked by dot dot. Now this is going to match any number of elements. We could have 100 elements into our array and this would match an array that started with one and two. And if this is the case, then we are simply going to print starts with one and two. Now let us see how our array would behave. Let's take the most simple example. And if I press F5, you'll see that an empty array is simply going to print out empty. 
Now, an interesting thing to take note of is that Godot will first of all match the sizes of the arrays. So, for example, if I were to have this array with only one element, Godot would look at the first match and the second match and the third match and so on. And if they had more or less elements, Godot is not even going to look through those elements. So if I press F5, this should now match with nothing. Okay, but now if I go with my exact match, so 1, 2, 3, and 4, you'll see that I can press F5 and it matches exactly on this. Now, the next one would be to have something like 2, 2, 3, and 4, and this is going to match something with 4 at the end because it doesn't care about the first element. Now, again, one more thing to be careful about is that we should keep the more specific matches at the top. Because if we were to have this at first, even though our array would have been 1, 2, 3, and 4, we would match on matched 4 at the end, because this perfectly fits with this, so we no longer get to check this specific case. And because of that, we are never going to catch this case, because our previous branch was more generic and caught everything that ended in a 4. What we can do is to now make this a little more specific, so let's make it a uh, 3 and 4, and also move it one step higher. So now, if we were to change this element to 100, for example, then we should be landing on this one. So if I press F5, you'll see that I have matched 100 and 4 at the end. So matched 100 and 4 at the end. Now, of course, if I change this 3 to something else, this is no longer going to match because it does not end with 3 and 4. So the next one that's going to match is this one which is going to write mashed for at the end. And now for our last case, is this what you've been waiting for? Say one, two, and four. If I press F5, you'll see that this starts with one and two. And even though it has only three elements, this matches anyway, because this matches any amount of elements. For example, I could write five, six, seven, eight, and press again F5 and see it starts with one and two which is amazing. Now for dictionaries, this is pretty much all the same. Instead of having an array of elements, we have key value pairs for which we can check. So for example, we could check for name team and print something. We could check specifically for name cashew and favorite food peanuts. We could check for cashew and a variable food to which we binded whatever value landed on favorite food here. And we could also check only for the keys. So we could check for someone who has a name and who has a favorite food. Finally, there's also the possibility to check for someone who has a name and maybe also has a favorite food or anything else. And of course, if I press F5, you'll see that since this was a cashew with the favorite food peanuts, we landed on the print oh no. Now let's imagine that we have to make a program which has to identify if we are in the working days of the week or in the weekend. Well, we could write a match on X, which if it's one prints work day, if it's two prints work day and so on. But yeah, this is a bit uh, cumbersome. And there is actually a better option to do this. We could instead write one comma two comma three comma four comma five and just print workday and with 6 comma 7 we could print weekend. If I press now F5, you'll see that the fifth day is going to be a workday. Now if I change this to a 7 for example, you see that this is going to be a weekend day. So it's really nice that if we have multiple conditions that would eventually do the same thing, we can comma separate them to write them more easily. Now, one special thing that I want to show you are pattern guards. What if, for example, we had these two numbers and we wanted to check if they are equal? What we could do would be to simply write match numbers. And if we matched to any numbers, so var x and var y, we could apply a guard by writing when x equals y and then print numbers are equal. Now, this will match any two numbers and will only move on with the match if the two numbers are equal. 
For example, I could do the same thing with var x and var y and check if the numbers are opposite. So when x equals to minus y and I will just print numbers are opposite. Now, if I press F5, you'll see that numbers are equal because x equals y, one is equal to one. However, if I put here one and minus one, you will see that the first guard will fail, so our match is not going to land, only the second guard will not fail, and we'll see that the numbers are opposite. Now, there's a lot of things that you could do with such a powerful feature. For example, you could make a system that checks for combos that the player might have made, or you could make a system that cooks food with some kind of recipe, similarly to how it is done in Don't Starve Together. And what I have here is pretty much exactly that. I have ingredients which have a name and a type of food, and if, for example, I am matching on three potatoes and one other ingredient that is of type meat, you will see that this will result in a dinner plate ingredient, which is just an image that I preloaded before. Now I have another case in which I made a function which checks if all the food type is a vegetable, just so I don't have to write this four times, and the resulted ingredient is going to be a vegetable tray, and if anything else doesn't work, then I'm just going to return a turnip. So if I press F5, you'll see that here I have three potatoes and a piece of bacon, and if I press craft, I am getting the dinner plate. However, if I now go to my ingredients and make the last ingredient a vegetable, maybe let's look here for broccoli and let's transform it into a vegetable. Now I have four vegetables as the potatoes were vegetables as well. And you'll see that this will give me a vegetable tray. Now, one other interesting project that you could make would be to try to write some logic programming in Godot. Now, I'm not sure how familiar you are with logical programming, but it's a very interesting subject. And this code here is written in Prolog. And what it does basically is to just append two arrays. And how does it do that? Well, it takes the first and the second array. And if the first array is empty, then it's obviously going to return the second array. However, if the first array is not empty, then it means that it has a head and a tail. Now, what do we do? Well, to the result, we are going to append the head and then call the function recursively only on the rest of the array, so only on the tail. Now, just for fun, I tried converting that into a function in Godot. And as you can see, I have two arrays. And if I match the first array, if it's empty, just like in the first example, I'm going to return the second array. However, if I found a head and something else, I can take that something else and consider it a tail, and to the result, I'm going to append the recursive call of the tail and the second array. Now, of course, finally, we are simply going to append the head to the result, but if I now go to the top and I declare two arrays, I could make var x equals to one, two, three, and var y equals to four, five, six, I could be doing here in my ready function, append two of x and y, and maybe let's just print this result, so print, and if I press F5, you'll see that I have an array which has the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, there are, again, many uses for this, so I'm just going to leave it to you from now. So, thanks again for watching, lots of thanks to my supporter on coffee, and see you in the next one.